All righty, good afternoon. Yep, I did that right five minutes after. Once again, I'm Andy Bias, board chair for Hack, and as always, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to thank all of you for staying. That's always a nice thing. I hope you've enjoyed the first part of your morning. Um, I want to make sure, too, I might as well start with this. Have we all loaded the app? Have we really? Have we? Okay. From a personal standpoint, I must have mentioned something to Terry that I wanted to lose some weight because every time food's delivered, she got me up speaking so I don't get to eat. I, I'm having a problem with that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this meal. I, I, I know I would have. <laughs> All righty, let's start this out. We have, uh, we have some guests here and I wanna make sure we get them introduced and get them in front of you. Mr. David Dangler, all right. He's the director of Naval Works Rural Initiative with Naval Works America. Became interested in economic and social justice issues early in life, just last week. Uh, thanks to a high school program called Greater Opportunity, where he served as a team leader in inner, for inner city kids. Mr. Dangler leads Naval Works America Rural Initiative. More than 110 of the approximately 250 network members serve rural communities, delivering essential services and making investments into programs such as home ownership, affordable rental housing, community revitalization, and economic development. Military veterans are a special focus. Since nearly 40% of the U.S. Armed Forces come from rural communities, compared to the national representation of 20%, Mr. Dangler is the founding member of the National Alliance for the Rural Policy, that's NARP, a member of the National Rural Assembly Steering Committee, and a member of the National Rural Housing Coalition's Board of Directors. In addition, Mr. Dangler currently serves on the board of Next Step, a national social enterprise committed to high quality factory built housing. Without further ado, Mr. Dangler. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, please, uh, you know, commence with lunch. Keep going. I don't want to keep you from this great meal. Uh, I promised uh, Chanteria that I would cut to the chase with the sponsorship remarks. So uh, you know, as far as Neighbor Works America is concerned, the message is simple. We love hack. Uh, you know? But, uh, but actually, uh, I think my, uh, my remarks are, are briefer than that bio on me. Uh, I don't know if it's happened to you that you hear people talking about what you've done and you wonder, who is that fella? I'd kind of like to get to know him sometime. It sounds interesting. You know, uh, for me, it's a special honor and a pleasure to represent NeighborWorks America in you know, giving these sponsorship remarks and uh, taking our place among the other sponsors in contributing to uh, what has already been an outstanding conference and is still going strong. Uh, you know, I think about um, the last two years and uh, I know I have not envied the board of directors of, of HACC as they went through the search, but boy, what a terrific result uh, congratulations to the Board of Directors and also to David Lipsitz. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. I should say to have you here right now. It's great. So, uh, and on behalf of the, there's something like 160 or more NeighborWorks organizations that serve rural communities. And um, I, I just would like the NeighborWorks uh, representatives who are in the room today from any of those organizations, please stand. Now I am interrupting your lunch. <laughs> thank you very much. And I, and I wanna say thank you for you know, what you do every day back in your, in your rural communities. Uh, 
The theme of this conference, Building Rural Communities, uh, places attention, of course, right exactly where it needs to be, at the community level. As I think many of you know, uh, we at uh, NeighborWorks America have gone through our own leadership transition. Our new CEO, Marietta Rodriguez, wishes that she could be here to greet you personally, but she's in Pittsburgh where the local partnership model that started us over 40 years ago uh, was, was created by a woman named Dorothy Richardson. Uh, some of you may remember the Neighborhood Housing Services partnership model. So although, um, although that was 40 years ago, our, uh, our rural initiative is, uh, is something of an upstart. I mean, it only started in 2001. I know that Marietta is uh, looking forward to meeting with you, David, as soon as uh, schedules will permit, and your leadership team. Uh, this is uh, really something of a, beginning, a new beginning for both organizations. Uh, we've got a, a long career of partnership behind us, but this is a new beginning. And I think um, as we think about building rural communities, and as we think about this session right now, where we are going to be looking to the future, uh, it's, it's a perfect theme for us as NeighborWorks America and HACK partnering and thinking about where we want to go in the future. When I think about who holds the venerable space in rural America as an intermediary and as an advocate and as a friend for rural communities, I know I always think of Hack. That's why it's easy for me to say we love Hack. So we are sharing in Hack's long-term commitment to the least of our advantaged of our rural communities. And that's why we held our 2017 National Rural Membership Conference in the Delta. Uh, partnering with Hope Enterprise, uh, learning about the Delta, learning about what's working uh, in the struggle with persistent poverty. It's also why we are happy to announce today that we will be returning this time to Appalachia in 2019, in September of 2019, to build on the lessons learned from our experience in the Delta to learn with our host, Fahi, uh, what's working in Central Appalachia, and really to ask the question, not let's talk some more about all that's wrong and all the reasons why we should despair, but rather, what's working? Uh, what can we learn? How can we do it better? And in the case of NeighborWorks America, of course, uh, how can we help? So I'm looking forward to this presentation and certainly I'm very optimistic about the future when we have partners as wonderful as Hack. Thank you all very much. Thanks, David, we appreciate that. Now you guys remember, I was up here yesterday and I said we had four Skip Jason Award recipients but I only handed out three. And not to short the fourth one, I thought it was a little more appropriate that we do it in a gathering instead of in the lobby when she got here last night. So, so just for that, here we go. We are, we're at a point now where we're gonna move on with the presentation and have our final Skip Jason Award recipient. Ms. Cassie Hicks, Director of Housing for the University of Southern Mississippi Institute for Disability Studies. Cassie has, uh, has been a, a housing advocate for over 20 years in the state of Mississippi. Recognizing that Mississippi is a majority rural state, she fostered relationships with rural partners like USDA's Dep uh, Department of Rural Housing Services to allow her agency to provide 
grant funds to help residents obtain rural housing. This partnership has been instrumental with USDA underwriting over $24 million in loans to the agency Hicks oversees. In her role as Director of Housing, Ms. Hicks is responsible for administering the day-to-day -day operations of her agency's housing program, grant writing, program development, disseminating of program information at local, state, and national levels, and the supervision of staff working on federal and state-funded projects. As an advocate for housing and an advocate for inclusion for persons with disabilities, her compassion has been very impactful in assisting populations in having better living conditions and having a place to call their home in Mississippi. She has been with the agency for over 17 years and has served with many committees and boards, including uh, that include being a funding member of a founding member of HUD's Housing Counseling Federal Ad, uh, Advisory Committee, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas Advisory Council. Her area of emphasis has been working with consumers seeking home ownership and homeless families seeking stable community housing to assist them to obtain safe, decent, and affordable housing and have a better quality of life. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ms. Cassie. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I can get louder. I'm a home by education instructor. So today I'm so thankful to God and to Hack for this award and this recognition, this honor. Especially thanks for rearranging your schedule on today to get me here to accept these, this award. I promise you, I left home yesterday morning at 2.30 a.m. It was my intent to be here, but sometimes you just have to roll with the punches and let it go. And so I came in after one, so I missed that opportunity. So thanks again for this time right now. Um, I'm blessed to have supporting me today my husband, Ray, and my brother, Master Sergeant Tim Lawton, who lives in the National Harbor area of Maryland. So my work in affordable housing in Mississippi began almost 25 years ago when I came into the arena of banking as a CRA officer. And I realized in that area, I wanted to do more for my state. I was limited in the banking area there uh, in my locality. And so I came onto a program that they were just starting in many states. Um, Home of Your Own is the name of that alliance that many states began to bring forward to make sure persons with disabilities in their communities receive services that was out there. Awareness was an issue with many. Advocating for them to be able to do home ownership in the states was a problem for many. So this became a national initiative and we came on board under the Institute for Disability Studies to help bring that initiative to our state. It was a very rewarding time for us, but began to realize it also was a time for much advocacy. We had groups, agencies, I would hate to say also lenders that did not know or believe persons with disabilities could enter the arena of home ownership and live on their own independently. So we had some hills to climb, but we began to climb those hills and bring on partners to help us advocate in our state. Mississippi being a much rural state, almost three million in our population, we began to reach out to your USDA offices to say, you know, we have consumers that are calling us that's using your program. They need us to help them with this housing issue around rural housing for them. USDA came on in a big way in that direct program. And we actually, as he mentioned before, $24 million it's why our consumers have utilized the USDA direct program. So we were glad they were on board as a big partner for our rural state. 
the Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas affordable housing program that was out there for special needs population in the rural areas came on board as a partner. $3 million invested in home ownership through that initiative. Many more others came on board to advocate for rural housing in our state, and we're much, much appreciative of them coming on board to be a part of what we were doing in our state. My impact I wanted to see was to touch as many of those counties in our 82 counties as possible. That was my impact. That was my vision. Not required by my funders that was funding us, but my vision. And so as of today, we have impacted 67 of our 82 counties with homeowners with disabilities that's living in homes of their own. As I take my seat before the bell rings on me, there's an old gospel song that we sang in our church. It says, may the work that I've done speak for me. May the service that I give speak for me. And may the life that I live speak for me. Today, in accepting this award, the Skip Jason's Award, I believe that the work, the progress, and the impact and the service have spoken. In accepting this award, I pray that the memory and the legacy of Mr. Skip Jason was given justice through my nomination and selection. For the many supportive housing partners, especially the community development officer that believed in me for many, many years, and she nominated me for this award, I said thank you. To Hack Selection Committee, I said thank you. I'll forever be grateful. Let me just say, in being a part of this conference for the last day and a half, or well, I've had, you know, day, missed part of it yesterday, I see a vision that Hack has put out there that's a very important vision and a mission for all of our states. And I'm happy to see at the ham, David, that's pushing that effort forward. On yesterday, I gave him another title. And the title I gave you, David, was David, the Haster, the Haxter and his staff. To me, David is now David the Goliath Slayer. <laughs> Why Goliath Slayer, Cassie? because I see him at the task of slaying in the midst of those who's not at the table, who's not in the conversation about affordable housing in the rural communities. Good luck with that work, and we're here to support you. God bless. Another hand for Cassie, another hand, come on. Let's see. Well, I still have a, I still have a guest to introduce. Mr. Rusty Smith is the Associate Director of Rural, Study, uh, Rural Studio Auburn University's War Eagle, uh, internationally recognized design build program. Established in 1993, Rural Studio gives architectural students a hands-on educational experience while assisting the underserved communities in Alabama's rural Black Delta, Black Belt Delta. The uh, students, in, in partnership with their neighbors in the local community, to define solutions fundraise, design, and ultimately build remarkable projects. Over the past decade, Rural Studio has expanded the scope and complexity of its projects to include the design and construction of community-oriented infrastructure, the development of a more broadly attainable small home affordability solutions, and a comprehensive approach to addressing insecurity issues related to income energy, food, health, and educational resources. To date, Rural Studio has educated more than 900 citizen architects, educated first at Auburn University and then at the School of Art Institute in Chicago. Rusty is a nationally recognized teacher and scholar. His honors related to teaching excellence include the uh, receipt of both the American Institute of Architects National Teaching Honor Award and the American Institute of Architectural Students National Teaching Honor Award. I'll tell you what, 
Rusty, you better get up here before I run out of stuff to say. So much, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for having us here today. Uh, obviously, you got, we got we to gotta, we gotta thank the folks that got us here. David uh, was the first, first person. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it is a, a real honor and it's humbling to, to be here because uh, in, a, in a group particularly like this because there's so many people in the room that could be up here instead of us talking about the amazing work that you're doing. And if, so, if you, so if you want to know the trick about how to do it, we, um, I think we met David uh, when he was so new at Hack that you didn't even know where the bathroom was. And, and we did. And we, before our meeting, we pointed you to it. And he was really impressed with uh, that. So um, here we are. So, so, so th thank you. Thank you, David. And obviously, every, everybody from Hack. But uh, Kelly and Shantari, I mean, uh, you guys know them. Uh, they're getting us here and, and shepherding us around and your whole team. We really, really appreciate it. Um, hopefully, um, I'm, I'm guessing that a number of, of folks here in, in, in the room know a, a little bit of something about Rural Studio. Uh, it's, it's always really nice um, uh, when we do, but, but, but typically when you, you know things about the Rural Studio, um, you, you sort of know about it from the direction from which you come. That's pretty familiar with a lot of things. And so sometimes when we talk about what Rural Studio is, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to talk about what it's not rather than what it is at, at, at first. So the, uh, the, the first thing that Rural Studio is not is we're not an architectural practice. We're not an architecture firm that hires students to, to, to do our work. We're also not a construction firm that builds projects. We're not a construction firm that hires young people to, to help us work in our, our community. Uh, and we're not an architecture school. Um, uh, the, really what Rural Studio is, it's a, it's a piece of a piece of a piece of a piece of a thing. And so the, the, the big thing that Rural Studio is a part of is Auburn University. Uh, we're a polytechnic land grant institution and that's, that's really important to our kind of legacy and our work, that land grant history uh, and mission that, that we have. Um, at, at Auburn University, we're sort of a medium-sized state institution. We've got you know, somewhere between 26, 27,000 students. Most of those students are undergraduate students. Um, uh, we only got about 4,000, 4,500 graduate students, so most of the students that we work with at Auburn are, grad, are, are undergraduate students. We've got 13 colleges at, at Auburn, um, uh, so it's a broad-based uh, university that you can study just about anything you, you might want to study there. Uh, one of those colleges is, is the College of Architecture, Design, and Construction. Uh, it's one of those 13 colleges. In that college, we have three schools. We have the, the School of Building Science, the School of Industrial and Graphic Design, and then we've got the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture. Uh, in that school of, of, of architecture, planning, and landscape architecture um, lives the architecture program of one of several programs that's in that school. Uh, the program of architecture, it's a five-year accredited program. That means our students come typically, uh, generally as freshmen, 18 years old, right out, of, right out of high school, and they study for five years with us, and at, 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 when they graduate, uh, they're uh, credentialed to sit for licensure and, and, and practice uh, as, as, as an architect, for the, hopefully for the well into their successful professional future. Uh, as part of that five-year program, uh, the Rural Studio exists as a piece uh, where our students um, have an opportunity to leave campus uh, and, and go out into uh, rural West Alabama and, and work um, in a community as, as, as part of their architectural education. And so it's that piece of the piece of the piece of the piece of the thing. Uh, it's a little thing. Uh, and it's that little thing that, um, that I want to talk about today. Um, we are a design build program. So it's sort of eponymously named. That means that our students, as part of that education that I just talked about, they uh, both design and build uh, all kinds of, of much needed community infrastructure in the communities that we serve. So as part of their education, they're working with real clients to, 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 to hopefully both learn how to be good architects and, and learn how to be uh, good citizens. That idea of citizenship is, is really important to us. Um, uh, this notion of um, uh, uh, being a citizen architect is really important. The, 
program was founded around a couple of really simple premises, a handful of really simple premises. The first, uh, and, and, and we say them and they're so ridiculous when we say them that it's like, I don't know why we say them, but it, I'm gonna say them anyway. The, fir the first uh, is that um, the best way to learn how to do something is by actually doing it. Uh, and so the university is all about uh, obviously developing knowledge uh, and, and through action and through experience is how we all transfer knowledge into know-how. And while knowledge is important in the world that we all operate in, that you all operate in, you know that know-how, the ability to know how to get things done is extraordinarily important. So that transference to know-how is really important. The second thing that the program is really about is um, that if you're trying to do something that's really hard and you don't know how to do it, the best way to do it is to do it together. And so the program is extraordinarily collaborative. So our students uh, work both with, them, with each other in teams. Uh, they work with uh, professional architects. They work with us as faculty members. They work with consultants. And they work with clients and community stakeholders directly to implement all of the work that, that um, we do. The third thing uh, is, 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 is maybe uh, a little bit more important. It's certainly more important to us. And it's this idea about um, uh, the, the, the uh, certain rights that we all believe that we have. And, and, and uh, one of the fundamental rights that we believe we have is the right to good, well-designed, uh, built environments, whether we can afford it or not. And that's really a key, important part of our program that we try to instill with our young people. So I talked about that idea of, of, of being a citizen, being a citizen architect. And our, our founder, uh, Sambo Mockby, would always talk about the responsibility that we had as architects, as professionals. We're, we're a professional school, we're a professional program. Our students go out and become practicing professionals. And the, the example that, that, that Sambo would, would use is he would say, if, if we're going to be professionals as, as architects. We got to think about kind of other professionals that are out there in the world. So we can think about uh, lawyers, for example. Uh, the right to representation, the right to representation is ensconced in our constitution. It's a constitutional human right, right? And, it, 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 and, if, and if you think about doctors, if a doctor's driving down the road, sees an accident on the side of the road, that doctor can't stop and check their watch and see if they have time to to help. They can't stop and see if the person that's in it had, had an accident uh, has an insurance card and, and can afford their services. They have to stop and act. It's not a moral obligation. It's actually a professional obligation. They'll just lose their license if they don't. And Sambo said that if architects are going to be professionals like these types of other professions, when architects see people in crisis, we have a professional responsibility to act. So our students are imbued with that idea about our professional um, responsibility. Um, you, can't, you can't learn to swim in a field. So this says this is an ancient Chinese proverb. I'll be honest, the provenance of that is a little suspicious because I, I, I got it on a fortune cookie uh, <laughs> out of a, a, a Chinese restaurant in Auburn, Alabama called Chengdu. Uh, but it's still, it's still really, I think, instructional. It's still really uh, valuable, this idea that you can't learn to swim in a field. So there's uh, obviously, if, you're, if you want to learn how to do something, right, you got to get out in the world and do it. You got to go to the place that you can, you can, you can uh, best learn the things you want to learn. And certainly we do that. Our students get away from campus, out in the world, and do things. The other way that, to think about this, though, is that's, that's uh, uh, maybe even a little bit more important for us is that we can invert that idea on its head. And if you begin to think about standing in a field, you begin to wonder about why am I thinking about swimming when I'm standing in a field? Why am I not thinking about the things that I can do right there where I find myself? So one of the other things that we hope that our students leave us with is that when they find themselves in the world and they, they look down at their feet and they look out in front of them, that there is a lifetime of work right in front of them, right where they find themselves. So we're a fiercely place-based program. We, we believe in the importance of place. We believe in the importance of, of neighbors. We believe in the importance of communities and, and, and being in a place doing work. So this, this is our field. Uh, it's rural uh, West Alabama, historically um, agricultural, uh, one of the bread baskets of the, 
of the United States. Uh, here's, here's, here's where we are, just so you know where we are. There's uh, sort of Washington, D.C., uh, uh, New York, Boston, the other Washington, way over there on the other side of the state, uh, or the, of, the, of the country. Uh, Detroit, Chicago, there's New Orleans, there's Disney World, Disneyland, and right smack dab in the middle of everything is Alabama. <laughs> this is Alabama. Uh, uh, Auburn, Auburn University is located over on the, the east side of the state, snugged up against uh, Georgia. Birmingham is our largest city. It's our, it's our financial capital. Montgomery, obviously our political capital of the state. Selma, we all know Selma's right in the belly button of the state. And over on the, the west side of the state, in this, this kind of black belt plain, is Hell County. Now, this, I show this because this relationship between uh, uh, the, the west Alabama, Hell County, uh, and Selma to Montgomery, the connection between those sort of uh, 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 places in Alabama are really extraordinarily um, Im important in, in many, many ways that I think everyone understands. We are in this, in this region that's called the Black Belt, right? And it's called the Black Belt because of, of um, you know, sort of mentioned the agricultural nature of the state. Uh, it's in this place where we, we have this rich, loamy soil that's been deposited over millions of years. We're in this sort of confluence of four major rivers uh, that have just sort of painted across the landscape over millions of years and left this soil. Uh, and and, and it's, it's really how, for so many years, we got food out of the ground. Now, our students come out today, and they say, we've, we've heard about this black belt. It's like, and they're out building and digging foundations, and all they have, they're just standing up to their knees in muck and clay. And they say, where's all this black soil that we've heard about? And we say, well, it's all gone. Over 150 years of poor land husbandry, we've lost over 23 feet of topsoil. So it's, it's, it's one of those countless things that are, impact these kind of rural and Im Im impoverished areas. We live in a food desert, this place that was historically agricultural. It takes a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of energy to get food out of the ground. We, we, uh, 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 the way you get food out of the ground in a place like this is you put fertilizer in the ground. Of course, fertilizer is nitrogen. Where do we get nitrogen? It's an oil product. We don't actually get the oil that we make fertilizer out of from here in the United States. It comes from the other side of the world. And so we take it out of the ground on the other side of the world. We bring it to the United States. We convert it into, into fertilizer, and we put it into the ground to get food here. These systems are remarkably complex, right, and sort of how we work. And dealing and, and addressing these systems are really important. It's also, a, it's, a, it is a, it's a place of, um, by federal designation, of persistent Poverty. So in this room, usually we have to describe that. This room knows what that means. Uh, over 20% of the population has lived consistently and persistently in poverty for, for 30 years or more. Those, uh, those persistently impoverished counties, uh, there's about 370 to 380 of them. And they run in a fairly contiguous belt, uh, you know, sort of across the, the Rio Grande Valley, the Colonias area, through the Louisiana uh, and Mississippi Black Belt, across uh, 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 um, delta across the Black Belt of Alabama, and then swings north up through Appalachia. All of those places are really different, right? They're, they're historically different, culturally different, uh, typographically and topologically uh, different. But one of the things that they all have in common is there are these historic landscapes of extraction, of resources being taken away for hundreds of years and no resources put back. Um, What's significant to this group, I would imagine, is that of those 370 to 380 counties, 85% of those counties are rural. It's, it, it really matters to folks like us in this group. It is a, it is a, a place of, of really great wealth, right? Both uh, financial wealth and cultural and historical wealth, but it's also a place of absolute abject poverty. The way people live in rural America today in the 21st century is stunning to most folks who don't get off the highway and are able to see it. Now, the truth is, I show this, I show this house, which is where the Harris family lived 25 years ago, one of our, one of our first uh, clients that we worked with. And the truth is, is there's not that many tar paper tenant shacks left anymore. This is what's replaced it is the second, third, 40, 50, 60 year old trailer home. This is, this is where most of our constituents live today. 
uh, and, it's, and it's pretty stiff housing competition. This is what we compete with. And you look at it and say, well, that's pretty easy to beat. And I can tell you it's not, not in the, not in the place that we work. So it is a place that's hard to get food out of the ground. It's, it's a hard place to work, but we've got remarkable neighbors. It really is an amazing place. It's a beautiful place, and we live there, and we love living there. Uh, we love working there with our, with our neighbors. Um, what did I do? There we go. Um, so this is, this is our downtown, it's downtown New Bern. It is a thriving metropolis of 186 people uh, in, in rural West Alabama. Uh, it's the place that we live and work. Uh, we are really fortunate that we actually have, these are uh, to, the, to, the, to, to your right is um, our mercantile. We have a grocery store that uh, still exists in the town. And, and to its immediate left is our federal building. We still have a post office that's open. And, and that's really important in these towns. If, those, if a town doesn't have those two things, it probably doesn't exist anymore, right? So being able to maintain these really important institutions are important. Uh, it's Francis Sullivan, our postmaster, that's a, a, a GB who runs the mercantile and our across the street neighbor, uh, Henry, who you can see, I think, is uh, my breakfast. Um, no, no, come on. Look, there's a little. A little orange juice right there on the corner of the screen. Um, this is, uh, it, it, everybody knows Auburn's a Cal college, right? Yeah. Right? Yes, Connie. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here's our, here's our school building, and, uh, proving that we kind of, I guess, are indeed kind of a Cal college. This is an Auburn University building. This is our, our it's called the Red Barn. This is our studio. This is where our students and, and faculty uh, work and, and, and teach. Uh, looks, if you're familiar with architecture school, it looks like any architecture school might. Uh, this is the Morissette House. It's the worldwide headquarters of Rural Studio. Uh, it's a working farm. Our students uh, live here and they, they, they work here. Uh, we're working to produce a lot of the, our own food that we eat. I talked about this being a food desert. And our students understanding that sort of all these systems that they work in are really important. And it's, it, and it's also important because, quite frankly, our young people come to us and they think this is what food looks like. Right? Or they think that's what food looks like. And if they leave, one of the things, the little things that we leave is hopefully that they know that maybe that's what food looks like, or maybe even that's what food looks like. Right? Knowing where our food comes from is part of increasing food security in, in our, our communities. Um, we, food is really important, right? We eat a lot of meals together. This is uh, Scott Peacock. If you're, if you're you know, sort of a food network junkie, you may know who he is. He's, uh, he's here working with the students on working on sort of teaching them how to, 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 to eat this, prepare this sort of zero mile meal. How do you eat in the place that you're from? That's really important. Uh, we also, our students build together, right? They design and build projects together. So here the students are under construction. This uh, greenhouse that we have that we've just finished up that actually begins to allow us to uh, extend our growing season uh, 12 months out of the year. It's a pretty straightforward thing and much needed thing where we find ourselves. So I, I, I say this, and I'll try to remember to say it over and over again because it's really easy to forget. Um, all of the, the projects that I'm going to show you today are all designed and built by young people someplace between the age of 18 and 22 years old, right? So everything that you're going to see is designed and built by young people between the ages of 18 and 22 years old. So uh, this is where our students live. It's called the Super Shed. Uh, uh, if you know anything about Rural Studio, particularly from the early days, we do a lot of material experimentation. We don't experiment on our, on our clients. We experiment on ourselves. So these are small, what their students refer to as pods that they've designed and built that they then live in. They're our dormitories. And our students, you can see, are good, neat, tidy, studious, and all clean, and all those sorts of things, just like students anywhere. One of the first projects, the first sort of complete project that the, that the studio designed and built uh, were projects like these. This was uh, the, the, the Hay Bale House for Shepard and Alberta Bryant. Uh, it's where the program started. It started with really simple premises. As to, there's a client in need and uh, working with students, we're going to design and build a home and, and, and give it to that client who otherwise never could, could have imagined affording it on their own. Another early project, the Butterfly House, is probably obviously why the Harris House is, is referred to as the Butterfly House, but it's, it's really thinking about how you begin to deal with water in a place and how you begin to live outside on this large uh, screen porch. 
Uh, we've, we've, we have done a lot of projects like this over the years where we take materials that don't have any value, in this case, carpet tile that's gonna go, this stuff that's on the floor here that's, that's gonna go into the landfill and begin to wonder about can we actually, can the students actually design and build a home? This is for Lucy Harris and her family out of this material that otherwise has no value. This is what our students look like. They're like students in, 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 any, in any other you know, kind of uh, architecture program. The way they, they start when they come out to us, they start, I talked about this sort of transference of, of um, uh, knowledge to know-how. Well, so they, they start out doing what we, we refer to as neck down work. So instead of working like they have on campus with sort of shoulders up, they, they begin to work with their bodies from shoulders down. In this case, this group of students were, we were donated this barn. They were tasked with taking the barn down, uh, collecting the material, sorting the material, and beginning to think about how they might use it. These kinds of projects are really important because one of the ways that you can learn how to build something well is to take something that's been well, uh, built well apart and, and sort of, sort of revert, begin to reverse engineer it. I mentioned that the work is real. It's got real clients, real budgets, real sites, you know, real outcomes. This is the, that group of students. Um, they're working with Rose Lee Turner. Rose Lee had been, uh, her house was falling down around her. Rose Lee was, dis uh, uh, her, her two, was living with two adult sons. They were displaced, one living uh, with a family member a county away, the other living in the neighborhood, but, but, but with a friend of the family. So the students are here meeting with Rose Lee, trying to understand what it is she needs, how they can bring that, that um, a, a, a kinship relationship back together. Those kinship networks are so vitally important to the efficacy and success of our, of our, of our constituents, of our clients. Uh, we work with, um, our students work with a lot of professionals, uh, both uh, professional architects, professional engineers, professional environmental engineers, all kinds of consultants to, to sort of learn how to, to do the work that they're doing. Uh, they know everything there is to know about uh, putting together, building the buildings that they've designed, and then they actually get out in the world and build it. So in this case, this is the little white house that you see in the background. That's Rosalie Turner's house that, where she was living. And um, the students had a really clear idea. It's a really straightforward and good idea. It's, we deploy this idea quite a bit. It's a replacement strategy where you take the family, in this case Rosalie, you leave her sheltered in place in her existing house, you build a brand new house right on the property, in this case, directly in front of the house. And then when that first part of the house is finished, you move Rose Lee out of the old house into the new house, tear the old house down, uh, and then build an extension that allows her to, to the house that allows her sons to, to move back. So this is the house under construction. That here you see Allie, she's working now on the interior of the house, this is being finished. All of the material on the inside of the house, this is, these are the sort of the bricks and the wood that came out of that barn that you saw the students taking, taking down. Uh, this is a picture of Rosalie and her two sons on the day the house was finished when they sort of moved into the first part of the house. And uh, front porch, you'll see in rural studio projects, whether they're houses or larger um, community work, that the, um, the, the front porch is always prominently featured. It's a really important uh, environmental room. It's a really important sociocultural space in the community. Uh, so these front porches are important. This is the house. Uh, so as soon as they moved in, the very next day, the students, you can see uh, Rose, the little white house there in the top left. That's Rosalie's house. Uh, the very next day, the students demolished the house and then built this extension off the back that, that actually, while it's a very small house, created this outdoor courtyard that actually made the home perceptually much larger. The living space is much larger because you have that really great outdoor room to live in. So we do a lot of houses, and obviously this group here is, is, is focused uh, with Housing Assistance Council, is here interested in houses, but we do a lot of other work. We do projects that in architectural um, terms we sort of think about as, as sacred and this sort of notion of sacred architecture relative uh, in, in the discipline of architecture really means uh, that it's, it's work in the public, work for the public to, to, to gather. In this case, uh, obviously, a, a church is a type of a sacred building. In this case, um, uh, kind of similar to Rose Lee's. The house, the, 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 or, I'm sorry, the church, you see the steps in the front. The original church was washed off its foundations during a flood. Uh, the students took that church down, repurposed the materials and built Antioch Baptist Church here in the background on the right. So this is the interior of the church. Again, you see the, the sort of the reuse of the materials from the existing church in the building. 
So we do sacred projects like that. We also do what in architectural terms are called profane projects. In architectural speak, that just means projects for the individual, right, that are, that are solely for the individual. In this case, this is a set of uh, bathrooms in Perry Lakes Park, a park that had, uh, Corps of Engineers Park that had been closed for almost 50 years, was being reopened up to sort of activities and, and tourism. And this group of students were tasked with designing um, a really simple set of bath bathrooms, just a simple piece of program that a park needs to, to operate. Well, the students understood that um, this was gonna take a lot of resources Right, resources that a community like this really doesn't have to build bathrooms. And if, and if you're gonna take all of those resources to do it, it's gotta do way more than just function as simple bathrooms. So the, the idea was pretty straightforward. The students said, um, it'd be really great you know, that these bathrooms could become the central gateway to the park, uh, that it's a, there could be a, a way that begin, begin to educate people about the park and begin to understand what it is to kind of get away from the city and come out into, into nature. And so they said, you know, we don't have a lot of time these days to slow down and stop and think and be contemplative, except if you're doing it right, maybe one time a day. <laughs> and, and so, and so could these bathrooms take advantage of that moment of contemplation and, and, and begin to tell people about the park? So, so this first toilet, this is, the, this is the, what's referred to as the mound toilet. You go in, there's the moment of contemplation, you sit down, and, then, and, you, and you look out across this horizon of the park to the, to the forest beyond, and you begin to think about the horizontality of the landscape. In the tower toilet, it's a 40-foot-tall uh, uh, tower, you come in, the moment of contemplation, you look up over your head, and you have this relationship with the sky <laughs> above. In the third one, because there's always three, in good projects there's always three of things, uh, you, you know the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees, right? When you, when you come in and you sit down in this, in this restroom, you have a very particular relationship <laughs> with a single tree. So it's really funny, right? I mean, it's really funny. And that's what's really remarkable about working with young people, is it's so serious and so funny at the same time that they, they can do things like that that are just really remarkable, really profound, and, and, and really fun. Um, we do a lot of work like that, park work. We've done pavilions, a uh, uh, 130 foot clear span bridge. At the time that this project was designed and built, it was the most uh, uh, technologically complex thing we had ever done. It takes a tremendous amount of engineering know-how to, to make a bridge span 130 feet, particularly when you're 21 years old and you're sort of building it by hand. Um, Group of students designed and built this sort of boardwalk through these beautiful oxbow lakes uh, uh, on the Cahaba River. And in this group of students, Natalie Butts is one of those students. She's sitting here. Put your hand up, Natalie. There's Natalie. Um, Natalie. <laughs> oh, wow. You haven't seen the project yet. <laughs> Uh, Natalie, Natalie works with us, uh, has been working with us for over a decade after, after graduating and, and, and practicing for a while. Uh, when Natalie was an undergraduate with us, they took on this project with this idea of, of, of designing the, the most beautiful, perfect, never before seen birding tower uh, along, these, uh, along the edge of these oxbow lakes. And they came to us and they said, we had just finished that bridge, right, that was really, really technically difficult. And, and Natalie and her team came to us and said, we know that the, there's no tower like this that, that actually will allow birders, people who come to watch birds in this very significant flyway uh, in the migratory path of, of, of birds here in our, in our park, there's no tower in the world that actually allows you to experience all of the ecosystems and the various ecotones where various birds live. I didn't, we didn't know this. Uh, their team explained it to us. You know, there's, there's all types of birds that live within a kind of a 10 to 15 to maybe 20 foot thick strata. They spend their entire life in these little horizontal spaces, some on the ground, some in the low canopy, some in the mid canopy, some above that just use the canopy, you know, to sort of perch on as they, as they move on. And they said, we're gonna build a tower that actually allows you to experience all of those ecosystems in one place. So we said, that sounds really great. How are you gonna do that? And Natalie and her team said, we're gonna build a 100 foot tall tower. 
So we had just finished that bridge that was almost impossible. And what Natalie's team proposed was to take that bridge and stand it on its end. And so we said, yeah, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, because some, not all things are possible, despite the kind of things we like to talk about. So, so they were pissed off, quite frankly, and, uh, and, and, and left, dejected. And I'll never forget it all those years ago. And then, but then they came back about uh, a, a couple of weeks later, is after the Christmas holidays. And, and they came back, and, and they said, we've got an idea. And we said, what are you going to do? And they said, we've found a tower It's 50 miles away that we can buy for a dollar. Can we have a dollar? <laughs> and, and, we said, and we said, that sounds, that sounds interesting, right? So Natalie and her team, uh, they, 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 they got really entrepreneurial. They got a, they got a, a tower erecting company to donate uh, services and equipment and training. Natalie's a certified tower erector. Uh, and they went, and here they are. They're taking the tower down. It's Natalie sitting up on the top there. Uh, moved it, regalvanized it. The design problem became where the tower's located in the park, how it's positioned, how the handrails work, how do the stairs work, how do the platforms work. All of that became the design problem as they reconstructed the tower here uh, in, the, in the park. This is the tower today. And of course, these are those views that you get as you move through those <laughs> levels of the forest. Little, little older today, but 20, 21 years old. It's amazing what young people can do if you get out of their way a little bit. We do a lot of projects like this, right? Uh, we take an abandoned building and we've uh, renovated and reappointed. This is for a, an organization called Hero. Uh, Hero is, a, is, is like many of the organizations here that do all kinds of work in the community uh, relative to housing provision, to credit training, to job training, resume development, all those sorts of things, providing them a place uh, in Greensboro to to work. We do projects like this where we take a, students take a, a, a burn down school building and they sort of renovate it into a, into a resource learning center from Perry County, which didn't have a, a, an after school facility like this. We do projects like this where Hell County Hospital, they get a, a federal grant to do an extension uh, 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 on, the, on the hospital and, and left it like in the money is this like, like or in the, in the funding is this money to, to build this beautiful courtyard here which, you can, uh, which is, you know, for the doctors and the nurses and, and, and patients to go recreate and rehabilitate. So you can imagine this, rural West Alabama. It's like a, you know, in, in August, it's a billion degrees and a trillion percent humidity. So you can, this is a really nice place, right? So, I was, so, so our group of students, four students, took this project on, and this is sort of what they gave the hospital. We do projects like this, where, and I know this is a project that I think David mentioned in his, in his uh, opening remarks the other day about uh, four students, uh, you know, Newburn didn't have a fire station. This group of four students uh, designed and built this fire station for Newburn so that they actually could execute a federal grant to get trucks. If you have to have a place to keep trucks if you're going to have trucks, right? So the students designed and built this building. It's a high performance, uh, passively operated building. That, that project, uh, because everything, you know, everything doesn't do just one thing in, in rural communities. Everything has to do a lot of things. So this building was designed not just as a, to house fire trucks. It was the first building that was built in New Bern in 110 years. It's an extraordinarily important building. It's an urban building. It begins to help define that urban edge on the street. It, it has a big front porch on it, like all I've talked about all of our, our projects do. Uh, it, it was also doubled use as a, as a community meeting hall. Right? So you've got a big building. All of a sudden, the community has a place to, to meet with intention. The next thing you know, the city council is reconstituted. They've elected a mayor, and, and they outgrow this space. And so the next building that was built in New Bern, designed and built in New Bern in 110 years, was the town hall, uh, which is right next door to the fire station. Again, designed and built by four students. What's really important for this project, not just the fact that it gives the community a place to meet and be a community, it actually is a consecrated place to vote. And voting rights is a real issue in these places. If you have to drive to vote, you probably don't. Right? So the ability to walk in your community and have a place to vote, really important. Anybody skate? <laughs> yeah, back there in the back. So uh, working with Tony Hawk Foundation, uh, these four students designed and built one of the most remarkable skate parks you might have ever seen. 
uh, we still actually do a lot of this, this kind of work where we have somebody will reach out to us and they say, hey, we've got this funny thing, this material that, that we don't know what to do with. We know you guys are pretty good at figuring out how, how to make something out of nothing. Can you use it? And so in this case, this is a, a company that were out in New York um, that contacted us and they said, um, we've got, we've got a, a, a product that we make. It goes in a 55-gallon galvanized drum. Uh, uh, it's, got a, it's a food product. It's got a, um, a coating on the inside of it, a food-grade coating that, that, that makes it really difficult. We can only use it once. makes it really difficult to recycle these things, and they just go in the landfill. Would you guys like them? And um, we said, well, can you send us a picture? And they said, sure. They sent us a picture. They're beautiful. These are like silver, pristine drums. And we said, well, these are great. Can you send us some? And they said, sure. So they sent us a, a truckload, 300. They come 300 to a truckload. They sent us 300 of them. And then the students uh, did what architecture students do. They organized them. <laughs> um, and, and we lived with these on our property for about a year, right? They sort of, and, and we'd come back, on, you know, from over the weekend and, they would have pushed them around. Again, they do what architects do. They make walls out of them. They stack them. They, they build rooms out of them, right? And so they have sort of were really sort of thinking about these things, what they could do with them. And then ultimately, about a year later, this, this group of three young women, they were working in Greensboro, Alabama, in Lyons Park um, to, to, to provide a playground for the kids in the community. And they said, we're not sure what we're going to do, but we're going to use those barrels. And so they learned how to weld. Uh, this is the, the project under construction. This is the project finished. So uh, about 3,000 barrels later, 24,000 welds later, this is the playground. It's extraordinarily beautiful, right? Incredibly artful, but it's also an extraordinarily fun place to play for the community. And we're all familiar with kind of unintended consequences. It's also kind of an extraordinary musical instrument as, <laughs> as well. Um, we do projects like this. So, so uh, this is going to take a little bit of explaining. I should, I, I should put better pictures in. So we do a lot of, so uh, in, in Alabama, our largest agricultural crop is two by fours and telephone poles. Um, we grow a lot of pine trees in Alabama. Uh, and as part of that process, uh, you, you sort of thin the forest, you cull the forest, you take away the kind of smaller underperforming trees so that those telephone poles and two by fours can grow faster and straighter, you know, quicker. And so in that thinnings process, you take out those small trees and they're all kind of weird dimensions. They're really big on one end and kind of skinny on the other. You can't, you can't really do anything with them. They typically would have gotten uh, put into the paper pulp um, uh, sort of industry, all that paperless office stuff is that we've heard about for decades. It's actually a real thing. The collapse of the paper industry took that product out. And so working with Alabama Forestry, we, we sort of worked to try to think about how we can begin to use that thinnings product as a, as, a, as a valuable commodity again. And so this group of students, they were working with Boy Scouts, uh, the local Boy Scout troop, and they, the, um, to, to provide them a, a place to meet, a scout hut. If you've got scouts, you know that's what they call it. And uh, so to provide them a scout hut uh, so they had a place to meet, they were meeting in uh, where one of their dads worked. He worked for fisheries. They had this old metal butler building that they, that they were meeting in. And they said, you know, when we, whenever we go to other Boy Scouts, we, we, they, all, they all have log cabins. And we want a log cabin like they all have. So our students went out into the world. They went to Tennessee. They traveled around Alabama. They went to Georgia, Florida, Mississippi. They looked at all these kind of Boy Scout huts that our scouts were talking about that they really liked, these log cabins. And of course, what they found, you can imagine, they're kind of metal butler buildings with split logs glued to the front of it to kind of look like a kind of a fake log cabin. And so our students said, well, we're going to build you a log cabin, but it's going to be a real log cabin. It's not going to be a fake log cabin. We said, that's great. You're going to use that forest thinnings product. And they're like, ugh. It's because you, you, it's, it's you, you can't stack it. All, you can pile it. You can't stack these kind of logs because of all their weird dimensional sort of stability. So they had a great idea. They said, we remember from our materials and methods classes and our structures classes in architect back on campus, what we, one of the things we learned is that buildings don't actually fall down. Like gravity doesn't make buildings fall down. 
What makes buildings fall down is actually wind load. So it's lateral load pushing on a building. It's wind load moving over the roof of a building that actually makes it act like a, an airplane wing and wants to pick up off the ground. And a, a building will eventually sort of vibrate itself to death until it collapses. Right? That's, that's, what, that's how buildings fall down. So they said, well, what, what we're going to do, uh, instead of using the logs to hold the building up, we're gonna, this is them sitting in front of a mock-up. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to build this sort of frame of, of, of what, in, again, in architectural terms is called bents, which is basically to build a building that has these sort of, uh, you see these openings to the left and right of this building. They're sort of like, they act like saddlebags on either side of the building. And you load those up with the logs. And instead of holding the building up, they actually hold the building down. Now, I share that kind of complex story because it's stunning. One of the remarkable things about working with young people is they can do amazing things because they don't know any better. <laughs> when, when trying to tackle these like really, really kind of wickedly complex problems, our own experience gets in the way of beginning to imagine what's possible. They can see things that our experience doesn't let us see. And that's what keeps us coming back to work every day. It's really amazing to work with these folks. So this is the interior. And so I also, probably one of the things that's important to share is, is if you know anything about Rural Studio, you'll say, you'll say yeah, I've, I've seen that work. Other buildings um, look funny. Right? When in architectural terms, we prefer the word idiosyncratic. Um, <laughs> but uh, they look funny, right? And there's, it has this funny style. And what I can tell you about design is design is not about style. It's not about what things look like. Good design is about what it is like. So this, this building looks like what it does. There's no aesthetic decisions that are being made that make it look this way. It's, it performs really, really well. And when things perform well, they are beautiful. We know it as human beings. It's sort of visceral. So that performance uh, manifests itself in many ways. How, how, would, how would anybody of you, so, so here's this building. It's kind of long and skinny. How long do you make a Boy Scout hut? Well, how long is a Pinewood Derby? Right? They can have a Pinewood Derby in their scout hut. All those other scouts that they go to, they got to go to, the, they gotta go to the, the, the gymnasium, the local gymnasium and things like that. They can, they can do that here. Those little things really matter. The little things really matter. This group of students uh, working with Boys and Girls Club, they're standing here. This is about nine months into their education. They're standing in front of, you know, I talked about, they, they know everything about how to build the building. They've just made their presentation, one of their final presentations before they start construction to their client. They're showing the client that they know everything about how to frame their building. They're standing here in front of this basswood framing model. This is them, a little grubbier, a year later, right? Uh, and the four of them, with that now full-size framing model where they're actually building the building. And this is the building today in Greensboro. And so here on the back, you can actually see that porch, that idea of the porch. Even this building has this big porch. This is sort of covered play porch on the building. And of course, providing these kinds of resources in the community for after-school education and activities is extraordinarily important. A project like this, the uh, uh, an old abandoned bank building in New Bern, group of four students renovated this building. It was a significant uh, interiors project into a library for a community that didn't have one. Had a, uh, there wasn't anyone, clo anyone close to within the service area. So getting this place another place of education, place of after school programs and things like that, really important. The other thing, we've, we've, we've been lots of discussions in, in, in this meeting and others just like it about this uh, broadband access. This building uh, brought broadband access, finally, to New Bern, Alabama. We've worked there for 25 years without it ourselves. And so it's a, it's a, you know, these kinds of things are really important assets. So this is kind of what um, David was getting at in his, in his remarks yesterday morning, is that you know, we're all here, we're interested in housing. And I'm up here boring you to death with kind of all this community work, right? Why, 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 why do you, if, if we're trying to, to provide good, dignified housing that's affordable to our clients, why are we sort of taking our eye off the ball with all this other stuff? You can talk about it in a lot of ways, but the fire station is probably the easiest way to do it, is that, you know, what happens if you don't have a fire department? Your house is burned down, right? 
What happens when an inordinate number of your house is burned down? You, you can't get insurance, right? And when you can't get insurance, what else can't you get? A mortgage, right? And when you can't get a mortgage, you're immediately pushed into this sort of chattel property or personal property, right? I mean, these, these issues that we're dealing with are not brick and mortar problems. They're not gonna be solved if you design the house this way or design the house that way. You have to tackle these problems across the entire system simultaneously, all at the once, all at once. So um, this is just to remind me to get a drink of water. <laughs> okay, so this is, so there's a competition between the two sides of the room. Who's got him? You got him over here? Who's got him over here? Over there, all right. Is this, did you, were you right? Yeah. Now see, uh, David, I changed the image because David and Connie saw this presentation a few weeks ago and they're real competitive. <laughs> and I knew they'd be cheating. So, uh, it's one of our books. Oh, uh, thank you. Ooh, I'll run. Who's over here? Some, I know there was a hand of all. Thanks. So, oh, you're welcome. So, let's talk about the housing project. You're gonna turn me off while I'm in front of the speaker. You guys are pros. Um, so, to talk about the housing project. So, uh, not that this is a competition, but it is pretty tough if we think about it. It's it's really tough to compete with. It's it it doesn't cost a lot on the front end. You can get one, you can, you can see one today. You can literally and proverbially uh, physically kick the tires and see if you like it uh, and, and be living in it tomorrow. You can see what you pay for. You go and look at it, right? And, and they're, they're, they're remarkably diverse product line. You can get um, white ones and brown ones and white ones and blue ones and white ones and yellow ones and even white ones and red ones. We've seen some of those. So you can get all kinds of them, right? Um, I put this up here to remind us of a, of a couple of things to say. One, I'm gonna talk about this 20K house project. Um, first thing I should say is we don't have a house that costs $20,000, first thing. Second thing, I put this up here as a reminder. Uh, you, you may not be able to read it, but if, if, you, if you sort of look, it's, this, this came out in July uh, of 2009, so almost a decade ago. And what it says down at the bottom, it says, uh, eight years after Mockby, says Sambo Mockby was our founder, it says the legendary design build program, that's, that's us, Rural Studio, the legendary design build program figures out affordable housing. <laughs> so, you know we haven't figured out affordable housing, right? So, uh, <laughs> Uh, these issues are really complex, right? But, but I, I, I do want to take a, a moment, if you're still interested, to talk a little bit about conceptually about where this project started and, and kind of where we're going. So uh, 15 years ago, the, the, the project started with a couple of really simple uh, premises. One is that, um, you know, we could, um, it's a research project that actually to develop beautiful, beautiful is really important, beautiful, well-designed houses that are affordable and uh, begin to promote an industry of, of home building, right? So this notion of workforce development was an important part of the project at the, at the very, very beginning. The second thing was is, is, is to begin to allow people to live within their means and make responsible home ownership an, a, a possibility. We could have lots of debates about it, probably you guys are smarter about it than, than we are, but there is a, is a belief in this country, uh, and there's a lot of institutions that support it, that home ownership Titled home ownership is the bedrock, it's the cornerstone of financial wealth be building, right? And so beginning to understand that was really important to us. And the third thing was, was that could we actually use our research know-how that we developed of years of working in this space locally, could we develop products that then we could then not scale our operation bigger, but then as a land-grant institution could give those products to give people the resources, the knowledge, and the technical assistance that are in their service areas, in your service areas, that could actually begin to use a product like this and deliver it, right? And so that's sort of the, some of the things that we're up to now. So the idea was uh, naively straightforward. 
um, was this notion of looking at how much uh, a homeowner in our, in our space 15 years ago could afford if they were sort of living on uh, a disability income or a social security income after retiring from 25 or 30 years of working at the catfish processing plant. What could they really afford, right? It was a conceptual problem that we gave to the students. And, and based on those at that time and on those numbers, they could afford a mortgage about $108. And at that time, that calculated out to $20,000. And she said, okay, that's great. What can we do for $20,000, right? So because we were looking at, again, conceptually, that, that there was a workforce component, there was a piece of it that was always carved out to say, well, OK, you were not just $12,000, but actually, could we reserve some of that to actually pay people something to begin to, to build these houses? So the students sort of came up with this notion that if, if uh, for $8,000, if you had a, a, a contractor and three laborers, working at regular construction rates that were close as we could get was in Tuscaloosa County, which was north of us. Um, if, they were, if, if you could substantially build this house in three weeks, that those folks could actually make a, a, an, a reasonable living. A contractor could make about a little over $60,000 a year building these houses at scale, and that a, 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 a laborer would be able to make about $22,000. And this was 15 years ago, and that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but this was, this was in Hale County 15 years ago when the median income was $18,500. Not the poverty level income, the median income, right? So, all of a sudden, now we can talk about like, you know, what a real working wage and all that kind of stuff is, but conceptually, that's a pretty good job, right, in, in those, those, those days. So uh, that idea has, of, of, of thinking about housing affordability and the cost of the house and how it's tied to workforce was really important all the way through the project and continues to be so today. The first thing we did was say, what can you do for $20,000, right? So or what can you do for $12,500 of material? So the first house is Elizabeth's house. The first house that was designed and built, it had $12,500 of material in it. Today, Elizabeth's house has about $29,000 of material in it. So you can just, from that standpoint, you can begin to understand like how this, you know, why we're, it was kind of idiotic to name this project after the cost of the house, but we'll get to that. So um, Frank's house was a version. We, we began to look at um, uh, uh, sort of uh, the quality of the houses, not just the, not just the quantitative measures, but the quality of the house. So we, we had uh, the pattern book house, a group of four students designed and built, which was sort of a modular house that could begin to adjust itself to its uh, site conditions. Um, we had uh, we, we looked at two-story models, like what can you what are the benefits and what are the challenges of building a two-story model house? We looked at, at commercial construction techniques. Here, a house is built out of steel instead of sort of locally procured wood. And then exactly the opposite, Mackenzie Stagg, who's also sitting here as a student, uh, has also worked with Rural Studio now for the for about three quarters of her life now. It's a house that she designed and, and led and took forward. Looking, you remember that sort of zero mile meal we talked about uh, earlier? This sort of zero mile house. Could you actually begin to build a house from material that's procured very locally? We then started saying, okay, well, those are houses that we can build, right? We've learned a lot about what people like, what they don't like, how you can use materials and those sorts of things. What could we actually begin to design that people like you in the audience could actually begin to, to deploy in, through your service population, through the, the sort of the methods and means that you use to address these housing affordability issues? And so we have a number of what we refer to as of the product line houses. We have Dave's house, Mac's house, Joanne's house. Um, People ask us, do you have accessible models? We've done a number of accessible models here. We've got uh, Turner's house, this, this notion of, of aging in place and sheltering in place and how those two things are, are inextricably intertwined. The folks that have mobility issues, the elderly folks in our community, they're the, they're the ones who can't get even get to the ditch in the front yard when a tornado comes, much less to the tornado shelter. So how can the home be resilient and, and help protect them in their home? Uh, Eddie's house, another accessible house. People ask, well, those are nice one-bedroom houses. Do you have two-bedroom houses? And we've got a number of those prototypes as well. Bobby's house, Idella's, Michelle's, Geraldine's, and Buster's. Um, we've, got a, we've got a house that actually begins to look at, uh, if you're sinking this, this kind of resource, can you actually begin to think about how your home can help generate income? We think about these extended families. Can you have a place where a, a family member can live with you? Can you have a space that you can run a home-based business out of? Can you have a space 
that you can actually begin to rent for rental income? How can that investment actually begin to return, get a return on that investment beyond just the house? So over the years, we've built numerous of these houses. We've got over 22 or 23 different prototypes of these houses, and they all have the kind of the same characteristics that many of the products that, that you deliver in your spaces have. If you're working in the affordable house space, these are the things you got to do no matter what you're doing. They've got to be durable, they've got to be buildable, they've got to be weatherproof, and they've got to be secure, right? Those are really valuable things. We believe you've got to move beyond even those sort of uh, the floor and begin to wander around where the ceiling is. Uh, a house has to have a sense of presence in the community. It has to foster a sense of community in the way that it's designed. It has to contribute directly to the community. It has to engender and provide a, a sort of health and wellness to the occupant. It has to provide accommodation. It has to be well crafted, even though it's designed and built out of local labor with lo locally procured materials, there's no reason it can't be well crafted. And so here's where we are today. So Rural Studio operates in a charity model. Right? We're working with some of the poorest of the poor that under no model that any of we've talking, or that any, anybody's talking about at this meeting, there's no model that's ever going to allow our clients to purchase a home for themselves. But we've, so, so we gift our houses to our clients. But that research that we do with our clients have allowed us to develop these houses to begin to think about actually can we begin to provide those homes through programs like ones that you represent here to a larger audience. Right? So we've um, worked to the, with the houses to make sure that they sort of meet residential building codes, universal design standards, lending standards, all those sorts of things. And, and with our partners that we're working with now, we provide a very comprehensive set of construction documents um, that allows them to go out and build houses. These are a couple of the first houses that, we, that were built uh, in Georgia by an external partner. And we learned a lot from these. We, sort of one of the things we learned is that no matter how the kinds of documents that we provide, we sh architects show builders what to build, but they don't show builders um, how to build it, or maybe even more importantly, why it's built that way. Um, so the next part of the project that we're currently working on is actually to sort of this sort of best practice guide to begin to think about not just providing construction documents like I showed you, but actually begin to sh provide instructional documents that begin to actually show you how to build it and communicate why it's built that way. And this why it's built that way is important. So how do we do that, right? Well, we all are familiar with the IKEA model, right? You, you take these sort of really great instructions, a pile of material and that goofy little tool, and all of a sudden any of us are like very competent furniture builders, right? Uh, house building is no different, quite honestly. It's not mysterious, it's not magic. Um, uh, we know everything about how the house is built. We know everything about the uh, construction sequence of the house. And um, we've developed, McKenzie Stagg has begun to develop these sort of instru instructions that sort of walk you through step by step exactly how and why you might build a house. Partners of ours like Habitat for Humanity love this sort of thing, right? That, that sort of are working with volunteers. So that's all great, right? That's all really great. But so what we've, we've, we've found, and this is sort of where we'll, we'll start to wind up, um, as I said before, you know, these are not brick and mortar problems. There's only so much that architects can do, right? And um, what we found is that our clients don't lose their houses because they can't afford their mortgage, right? That sounds funny, right? Our clients don't lose their houses because they can't afford their mortgage. There's typically kind of four big buckets of things that actually happen that cause our clients to lose their house. The first thing is, is they, they have an unexpected energy bill. We live in a place that in March and April, you might have an energy bill that's $50, $60 a month, and in July or August, it might be $300 a month. And you didn't do anything different. The house was the same temperature, right? It's the same humidity. And you had no idea to know how much it was costing you until it was too late, right? So that's the first thing that happens. Second thing that might happen is you have an unexpected um, uh, uh, maintenance or repair bill on your home. So we live right in this sort of tornado alley and right in the catcher's mid of the Gulf where, where uh, uh, hurricanes turn into tropical storms, right? And so home damage is, you know, this sort of issue of resiliency is, is really important to us. The third thing that happens is you have an unexpected health care event in your life. 
that gets you upside down. And the fourth thing that happens is you have an, just a, an economic disruption in, in job. Most of our workers are working multiple part-time jobs. They're doing shift work that can be seasonal. Uh, they're, they're sharing everything. They're sharing transportation. They're sharing food. They're sharing child care. They're sharing elder care. You have a little bit of a financial disruption in any of that kind of stuff, and you can lose your house. None of that has to do with what your mortgage costs. The bank does a really great job of, of figuring out that you can actually afford your mortgage or they wouldn't give it to you, right? And it stays the same month after month, year after year. So how can we, in the procurement of these homes, actually begin to tackle the things that really, really impact home affordability? So this idea of not just asking what the house costs, right? That's a really important question. I don't want to ask like that's not an important question but asking a question that's more useful to our work, to our work, is what does the home afford a homeowner? Not what does it cost a homeowner, what does it afford a homeowner? What does it afford a homeowner? What does it afford the lender? What does it afford uh, the insurance company? Right? And can we begin to think about this total cost of homeownership? Not ho house cost, but home ownership, and begin to think about this issue of affordability a little different. So we were as dumb as anybody, right? We even named the darn house after how much we were, we were thinking about how it would cost. And we started with this monthly burn, but we went right into that sort of construction cost. And what we should have done is really looked at that monthly burn, right? That's where we should have spent a lot of time. And so that's one of the spaces that we're operating in. So here's sort of con the, a conceptual model. Uh, this is a, a, a numbers from Buster's house. I showed you, went by really quickly. Uh, Buster's house, two bedroom, 900 square foot house. These are the kind of the operational numbers. Uh, you know, you can, we can build that house uh, in, in working with Habitat right, with, a, with a, a mortgage of about $230. It operates pretty efficiently, about $150 a month average in utilities, uh, built to contempt, contemporary energy standard. It's got about a $60 a month insurance cost on it, right? So. We can begin to think about reducing energy, right? Architects know how to, how to reduce energy. Our partner, Sam Rashkin, sitting here with the Department of Energy, he knows how to reduce the energy costs in a, in a home, right? So say we can reduce the energy cost in a home by $25, right? That can, that, that, that's, um, qualitatively, that sounds like a great thing, but what does it do, right? Putting $25 in somebody's pocket honestly doesn't really move the needle at all, and it costs a lot of money, right? It makes the house cost more to save that $25 in energy. Remember, we're trying to reduce the cost of the house, right? So if, though, we start to think about that total cost of homeownership, and we begin to think about if we can just take $1, if we can save $1 in energy from that utility cost, you see that on the bottom row, and we take that $1, instead of putting it in our pocket, and we attach it to our mortgage, our monthly mortgage payment, well, what does that do? It actually buys $200 of construction, right? So all of a sudden, if we do that with that $25 that I was talking about, that's $5,000 of additional construction a homeowner can afford at no additional cost. And it makes a better house. It makes a higher performing house. It makes a home that's actually worth more, not less more. That's good for the homeowner. That's good for the lender. That's good for the insurance folks, right? So. It's, it's a, not a conceptual project, it's a real project. This is a version of Buster's house, it was under construction. Uh, this was built um, uh, to uh, passive house standard, which is the highest energy performance standard you can build a single family home to in this country. It was also built to fortified gold structural standard. It's the highest resiliency standard you can, you can build a home to. It's really hard, I won't talk, in, talk to you too much about why it's difficult. Uh, but this is an affordable house built by Habitat. It's the only home in the United States that, that's built to both of these extraordinarily high standards. And it's an and it's affordable house. What makes it affordable? So this is, this is, and this is the house that's finished up uh, almost two months ago now. The homeowner's been living in it. So here's how those numbers work, right? I showed you this before. So that, that in, 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 in the original house, sort of built to contemporary code standard, not to these high performance standards, here's how the model works, right? All of a sudden, when we begin to build to this performance standard, you can see we reduce the energy cost from $150 a month to $35 a month, smoothing out that energy bill. Because we've built to that resiliency standard, we've reduced the insurance cost. You get an insurance break to the, to the homeowner. But look what we did, right? We, we sort of blew up that mortgage cost from $250, which the owner qualified for that she could afford, and now all of a sudden we've blown that mortgage up to $343 and made the home unaffordable. 
right? But look at the total cost of home ownership. $460 a month went to $426 a month. Had a monthly savings of $34 a month for the client. So which house is more affordable? Which house is more affordable to our clients? Which house is more affordable to your clients? Right? We've got to think about this problem broadly. We've got to think about it systemically. We've got to think about it holistically. And we've got to tackle it at all points along the spectrum. We'll finish up, and I'll say um, this is a real project. These are the kinds of partners that we're working with that are invested in, 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 in making this happen. And we're always looking for new partners. We're looking for brain partners. We're looking for funding partners. We're looking for partners like you that are actually need a house like this and can help us work through this model, make sure it works, challenge our own assumptions, help us know what we don't know, let our preconceived notions and our experience get out of the way and begin to how, understand how we can make this project uh, better and better and better. Um, really important to us. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Uh, I think we've got a few minutes. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, that's, that's really kind. <laughs> so I live in Montana, in Colorado. Yeah. And I have Lucky. a Habitat affiliate that builds SIPs panel homes. Yeah. Costly, you know, but super energy efficient. And right. the motto is that if your utility bills exceed your house payment, you're in trouble. Right. Because who, what are you going to pay for first? Right. right. So um, obviously our climates are two different climates. Yeah. Uh, they don't build garages because that helps them afford the house. Right. But do you have any models? You guys work in other states or other uh, climates that you that you can offer ideas for? Or yeah. So so currently, you know, the, where where we're working, we've got about a 13 state footprint that we can that, that the houses that we've designed that we have currently actually operate within, and we and they, they perform well in, and, and we actually think about performance in a. In a, in a broad sense, not just energy performance and resiliency performance, but there's sort of socio-culture and historical factors of performance that are, that are, you know, we've got a kind of a southern rural house, right? And so, um, you know, sort of how it performs well. We've got a, about a 13-state footprint with these houses that are designed. So there's thinking about this problem is there's things that are particular, right? There's sort of things that are particular to location and region, and there's things that are universal, and beginning to understand what's particular and what's universal. So we're sort of in the hardware business, right? We're architects and we're providing houses. A huge part of this project is the software business, right? Which is what a lot of you guys are in. It's the policy, it's the programs, uh, it's the products that, that, and services that actually allow and make these sort of ideas possible. A lot of that software stuff is universal. And so it takes a little bit different house. Uh, can we do that? Yes. Uh, are we doing that? Maybe. Um, we're working within the capacity that we have in the, in the space that what we've got actually begins to work. But if it works, and we believe it will, uh, you know, our national and federal partners, you know, they, they want this thing to roll. And what's, what's really, for us, what's fantastic about it is this, this is not just a thing that helps poor, underserved communities. If these ideas work, they help us all. Right, they change housing affordability, the way we think about housing affordability for all of us, right? And what's fantastic, I think particularly for a group like us to think about, we always think about challenges, but the opportunities, it's like the, you know, the, the desire to do this at the upper end of the market doesn't really exist, right? But it exists in our space. And if and, if and when it works, it, it will actually trickle up in, in ways that not many things do. Right? And I think for us, that's a really exciting kind of opportunity in this project. So we'd love to talk to you uh, and, and, and show you what we've got, show you where we're going, give, show you our roadmap. And that's true for everybody in the room and, and see how to get there. Uh, oh, hey. Yeah. I, I just love it. Thank you. Um, 
I, we're with Habitat. This whole table is Habitat for Humanity. And um, we've been experimenting with um, cottages, is what we call them. Yep. And smaller, especially homeless, uh, transitioning into permanent housing, yeah. veterans, small family units. But your program, has it been replicated anywhere else with any yeah. other university? I, you know, in Kentucky, I mean, we you know, brag about University of Kentucky and University of Louisville and the urban yeah. design studies and this, that, and the other. We've done some Habitat Passive Houses. We've done LEED Certified. I mean, you know, we've done, but, you yeah. know, it's a question of education. I mean, for, for my affiliates, I'm the state office, in what a house looks like <laughs> and how it operates for that family. Yeah. And, and, I mean, to me, it's all changing. It's and has really been changing for quite some time because I feel in Kentucky, Habitat is one of the few organizations that can serve that income family that you put up on your slide, except we're looking at 733 or below a month on right. SSI and disability. Yep. And how do we make that affordable, especially in rural communities where nobody wants to live in multifamily? Yep. They don't necessarily want to rent. They want their own home. They want their privacy. They want their land. And so this is incredible, but I, I just feel like our U of L and U of K need to get on this. I mean, you know, really, <laughs> really sincerely need to uh, get on the bandwagon and, and help us, you know, do yeah. what we're trying to do. Uh, so I, I want to bring you to Kentucky and talk to all of us. We're, Are we're you ha available? Happy to, <laughs> happy to. Uh, I, I do a lot. We do a lot of that uh, as we go to other universities and sort of because because it is things that folks want to replicate. And I, and I should say we didn't invent this. Like Sambo and DK when they started the program, they didn't invent it. There were there were there were uh, at least six other. Uh, uh, design build programs that were already established in architecture programs at Yale Building Project was you know sort of one that every, every, everybody knows. Uh, there was also a lot of service learning projects that you know, that's gone on in the university for forever. The invention that kind of Sambo and DK had was the coupling of those two things together, which is kind of a no-brainer. You know, it's like you, you sort of take this notion that to, to, of, of learning how to design things by building them, and that you do that in service to your communities. That was the thing that that was invented. So we were sort of, you know, six or seven. There were there were universities doing that 25 years ago. Today, uh, there's a there's um, in the United States and Canada, there's about 155 uh, accredited program programs of architecture. There's over 60 design build programs that are established. Um, now, none of them have the scale and scope for lots of reasons that ours does. That's the just the the truth, and the, some of those are, I uh, um, can use university language about why some of that is. One uh, is it's, um, so the university language, it's really inefficient way to educate young people. Uh, ar architecture school is already really inefficient. We've got full professors, small class sizes, 12 to 15 students, dedicated classroom spaces for large classroom spaces for 24 hours a day, seven days a week to those 12 or 15 students. It's already really expensive. And then you lay this on top of it, right? And it's extraordinarily um, inefficient. So it's one of the things that we've decided to do. It's, you know, this is what our five-year program does, is this. To, to, and, and, it's, and it is, you know, we're really fortunate that the university sort of understands it as an exemplar of that land-grant mission that we have. So it's relatively unique to our university. Our... Um, um, uh, sort of statement at the at the at the university that that it it starts with our creed the Auburn creed they call it it starts it says I believe in a practical world right and we do right we believe in a practical world uh, we believe in a practice based world that's part of a practical world so this practice based education is something that's that is we understand at our university it also has a line in it that says I believe in work hard work right. And we do. We believe in the power of hard work and that kind of experience. So those kinds of things are in our DNA at the university. Um, makes it uh, really valuable for our university to, to, to accept the cost and, and the liability and the risk that's kind of associated with doing this kind of community-driven work. Sam? One quick question, Dusty. Uh, do you track what happens to the students that go through the program? <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so the question, because uh, Sam didn't have a mic, was, was, was do we track what happens with our, with our graduates? Well, we basically hire them all, and they, they come and work, work for us. No, um, we do. Right? We're doing a better job of that. We used to, it used to be a really hard question to answer, quite honestly, when we would do conversations like this 15, 20 years ago. There was a guy named Friedrich Kiesler back in the 60s that, uh, when he was describing what it took to be an architect, and, the, and, the, and the, 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 one of the, the fundamental constituents that he said that you had, to, you had to be to be an architect was that you had to be 50 years old. Uh, it's an old person's profession, historically, right? And it sort of takes a long time to develop a practice and those sorts of things. So, you know, our program's 25 years old. So our oldest graduates, you know, are, are, are actually getting into the prime of their career. So 10 or 15 years ago, we didn't have that. And so we'd say, oh, well, you know, they're out working for really great practices and doing big, great, beautiful buildings and those sorts of things. And we do have a lot of graduates that are doing that. Increasingly, um, our students are pursuing this work. There's, a, there's an emerging mode of practice in the design profession that's called public interest architecture. It's a different mode of practice that's within the public interest of sort of looking at not just the client's interest, but the, the built environment exists within the public realm no matter who pays for it and who owns it. And it has a responsibility to that public. So this mode of practice is, is, is growing. And, and we have uh, Javier Vendrell, the director of our graduate program. We have a new graduate program at Rural Studio that's directed at teaching students how to work in this emerging mode of practice. We also, I, I will say, um, you know, there's architecture school rankings come out. It's another way to kind of talk about this, Sam, is, you know, architecture rankings come out every year. And, and when we, and, and we're a highly ranked program, we're always happy about that. But when we, when we, when we are like move, move high in the rankings, higher in the rankings and get close to, you know, sort of number one, we're like, oh, yay, that's great. And when we go down in the rankings, we're like, oh, those people don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> But what I like when the rankings come out is they always have, um, they have these sort of questionnaires, right? And uh, they're sort of, they mine other kinds of data. And, and so um, uh, one of the things uh, a couple of years ago, they asked students who are about to graduate from these top 25 schools, they said, where do you imagine working when you, when you graduate? And there were things like big practice, small practice, residential practice, commercial practice, all those sorts of things, go back to school, those sorts of things. At the very bottom, there was a little bubble you could scratch, and it said, work in the uh, uh, not-for-profit slash public sector, right? At the bottom of the list, as everybody here might imagine. And um, uh, you go through the top 25 schools, and sort of as, as graduates from those schools rank those, that, that bubble was always checked at, by like 0 to 1% of those graduates. Tulane University, which has a great design build program down on the Gulf Coast, they had a statistical outlier. Seven percent of their students checked that box. They said that's the work that they wanted to do. When you got to Auburn, 29 percent of our students checked that box. Now, well, Thanks, but, but, but we're, we're pretty well convinced that our students aren't very smart, and they thought that, not, that architecture in, in and of itself is, we don't make any money, so it's kind of a not-for-profit venture. So, so no, the, 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 you know, the truth is, that was really moving for us. Our students come to Auburn to do this. We're known nationally and internationally. Students come from all over the United States to study with us to do this work. Um, and more and more of our graduates are getting out, and they, they are working for not-for-profits. They... Um, uh, are working, they're starting their own not-for-profits, they're starting their own uh, B Corps, they're working for folks like, you know, sort of uh, uh, NIT down in, um, you know, Brownsville and organizations like yours. You know, they're looking to do the kinds of work that you're all doing. So, it's a, yeah, we're, we're doing a, a better and better job of, of not just tracking it, but preparing the students to, to do it. All right. My question, I guess, is also sort of about scale. Um, I live in Chico, California, a council yeah. member, 10 miles from Paradise. And sort of an unfair question, but 12,000 houses incinerated, 25,000 people living in our community, basically homeless. So we have a challenge of accommodating tens of thousands of people in temporary dwelling units, secondary dwelling units, new development, and eventually, hopefully, rebuilding Paradise. But, uh, and this is very exciting, because right now I think those, the rebuilding is gonna be RVs and single wides. Yeah. Um, 
So your comments. Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. The, you know, the, the, the question of scale, I, mean, it's, I think we, we don't understand. There, we, we can't, as human beings, we can't even begin to conceptually grasp the, the, the condition that we're in, in this sort of housing affordability crisis and the, just the housing inventory, like we just went down in inventory, right, is sort of what, what you're sort of responding to. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really good at, at numbers, but I, you know, because, you know, Fannie Mae is, 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 you know, sort of one of our folks, we sit, in, we sit in meetings and they sort of talk about like trillions of dollars of this and trillions of dollars of that. I can't, you know, I, I, I can't follow it along, but, but you know, uh, with, with some of their research and some of our, the, our researchers from the USDA and, 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 and information that we've got from HACK, beginning to look at kind of actually the scale of this problem. It's a trillion dollar problem. You know, I, we, we, worked, we worked with the, uh, the, the um, Joint Center for Housing at Harvard just to figure out like what our, like what's the, actually what's the space of our tiny little house in these underserved uh, persistently impoverished communities if we just replaced the substandard housing that's in those rural counties with a client that meets the financial performa that's already existing in a house that's titled as real property that can fit within a one or two bedroom house, right? That's a really small, narrowly constrained problem, right? Joint Center for Housing has worked with us. That's about an $8 billion problem to, to solve, right? That's, that's plenty of problem <laughs> for a little program like ours. So, so, so I guess, you know, the way I'm talking around the answer is that I don't know. The, the, you know we, we act like we're in competition with each other, like this is the right answer or that's the right answer. If it's modular housing or, 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 or factory built housing or tiny houses or site built stick frame housing, I can tell you it's all of those things and more things that we haven't thought about. We got to do every single thing that you hear about. It's going to take all of that to even have an idea of being able to keep up maybe not even getting out in front. It's a huge problem. Yes, ma'am. If you look at what the uh, social impact is for the smaller house as compared with the house that is, whether it's a rural community or not, there's a social impact based on what people perceive to be those, quote, who have made it and yeah. I'm trying to make it so that yeah. home ownership is the first step. But right. when you impose a restriction on space, mm -hmm. like 600, 800 square feet, yeah. does it impact the markability of the very people you're trying to serve? That's a, that's a good question as well. The, um, I mean, I can, I can tell you a story about the Habitat House. Like those ideas about what makes a house valuable are changing. All right, one of the problems of building a small house is that the, the, the cost per square foot goes up. Like all of the cost in your house is in a couple of places. It's in kitchens and bathrooms. Everything else is just drywall, right? It's just like how much drywall is between those things. So when we build a house that's more valuable because it's bigger, it actually is just more drywall. Right, so we're beginning to understand those things. The, the, um, the client that moved into the Habitat house, so when we first started talking with, we, we, we worked with Habitat in their traditional space, uh, you know, sort of three twos and three two and a halfs and four two and a halfs and even five bedroom houses. We worked in that traditional space at, at Auburn, not Rural Studio, but in the architecture program for almost two decades, right? And so our product is, moving into a space that's, that's sort of under, underneath that in these small houses. When we first talked to Habitat four or five years ago about this particular product, we sat in a meeting that had, that, that, that had representatives from, from kind of all over the southeast, and they all said, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't really have a client that meets this little house need. We need bigger houses than that. And it was one person. She was the director down in the Wiregrass, and she, she asked the question. She said, how do we know that? Because... These are the only houses that we have, and so 
these are the clients that we have. She said, I actually think we have a lot of clients like that. So fast forward to the client that we just put in the house in um, Opelika that I showed you in that high performance house. They, she qualified and they were about to put her into a three bedroom, two bath house. And she said, I, I, my husband just passed away. My daughter, my oldest daughter just moved out. I don't want all that house. I want a smaller house. I want something that I can manage and take care of and, and those sorts of things. And so she actually liked the one bedroom house. And, and so what, but. That is true. Until I can afford what I see other people have and I don't want it. And I was just wondering, in your experience, even though you can justify yeah. the energy efficiency, the lower utilities, actually the more productive use of space. Yeah. Some people who need housing desperately are going to say, I don't want it. Because they stand, that's they, they'll stand in their way. What, yeah, so those things are changing. We know, that, we know that people are downsizing. People are want smaller, not bigger. People are moving to the cities and moving into smaller spaces. And this idea of, of living less and living with dignity and, 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 and living within our means is something that the clients that are in our houses want. Um, not everybody does, and we don't have a product that there's other, you know, there's, I, I hope there's other products out there that, that meet it. What we did run into is that in the Habitat house was that our, the client wanted a smaller house and we actually couldn't put her in a smaller house because it was too small. It couldn't get through zoning. You had to build a house that was over 800 square feet. And so she's in a two bedroom, one bath, uh, which is a great, beautiful, high performing house, but it's more house than that client that wanted. And there's enough clients out there, we believe, that want these that is well beyond our capacity to provide, provide it. So it's not for everybody. I think that goes back to that question about like what is the issue, what is the problem, what's the need, and how do you fill it? And we're, we've got a, a little thing that feeds, fills a particular need. And if, it, and if you have clients that want a house and need a house, like what we're talking about, we'd love to talk to you. And because and, we need all of your help to figure out how to make this thing work. We got a long way to go. So I know um, I'm a little over time. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to hush up. But thank you all for all your time and your attention. I really, really appreciate it. I tell you, that was a tremendous program, tremendous product. We can't wait to see what the future holds. Another hand for us. And, and Rusty, Rusty, on a personal note, I want to thank you for talking long enough that I had my salad, I had my entree, and the dessert. So I appreciate that. <laughs> As always, folks, we want to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors of HUD, USDA Rural Development, Home Depot, Wells Fargo, and Naval Works. Now, I want you to enjoy the rest of your afternoon and enjoy the, the, whatever it is that you're going to go to. But today, there's a reception, 6 o'clock. For those military folks, 1,800 hours. We need you here on time. Please, I was paid to say that. Thanks again. Y'all take care.